Good evening, uh, ladies and, and, and gentlemen, and, and welcome to this milestone event. My name is Edward Maltby. I chair the Sibthorpe Trust, and it's been my privilege also to chair the special partnership with the British Ecological Society and the Chartered Institute of Ecology and Environmental Management, which has brought people, politics, and the planet any questions together. You can read details about the three partners in your program. We are delighted about the theme that has captured the public's interest in our environmental future, as well as the ecological and environmental professionals, and of course, that of the politicians that are with us this evening. Welcome to you. At a significant time, 58 days before the general election, this event marks a growing recognition of the real significance, and not just academic or moral, of the natural environment in all our lives, underpinning the sustainability and health of our economy, contributing to all aspects of well-being, and providing the resilience to combat global threats such as climate change and food security. These are in addition to the more traditional conservation views emphasizing wildlife and habitat. Our management of the environment is necessarily determined by political decisions and priorities. But government's use of best available scientific evidence and other knowledge has often been lacking. It is now your chance to question members of the main political parties on how they propose to manage our environment for the future. We hope by the end of the evening we shall have a clearer vision of possible future government policy and how we might all meet some of the serious challenges ahead. To help us do this, I have great pleasure in introducing Jonathan Dimbleby to keep us and our panel well focused. Jonathan Dimbleby. Thank you. Everyone, almost everyone, accepts that nature has an innate value. Most accept that it is of importance to our economy and to our society. We know most of us, that the world's ecosystem is fundamental to our survival. That is easy for everyone to acknowledge. But then you get to the specifics, all of which, in one way or another, under challenge. I will just take a couple of them. Take, you know, biodiversity, the loss of species, tens of thousands threatened with extin extinction. And then, of course, climate change. And I could go on, I'm not going to, because some of these are going to come up. They pose challenges which some people find extremely difficult to accept, and even when they are accepted, find it very difficult to uh, uh, acknowledge that the policies which they seek to adopt may not reach the solution that they uh, would like to promise us is around the corner. A great many words are spoken by scientists, naturalists, biologists, Botanists, campaigners, politicians, just take a couple of them, three of them. David Cameron on energy efficiency. Those who say we can't just afford to prioritize green energy right now, my view is we can't afford not to. That was before 2010. <laughs> Ed Miliband, I, I am incidentally strictly in the neutral chair here, as you will just hear from the next quote. Ed Miliband on climate change. Margaret Thatcher was the first political leader in any major country to warn of the dangers of climate change. And David Cameron again last year, climate change is a threat to our national security, to global security, to poverty eradication, and to economic prosperity. Now, this, any questions, as Ed has already indicated, is to tease out the position of those who would like to be in a position to influence the debate even more by being significant players, or their parties, significant voices after the forthcoming election, which is now two months away. 
and they are to introduce them. Uh, Barry Gardner, who's the Shadow Minister for the Natural Environment for the Labour Party. Uh, beside him, Dr Ailey Whiteford, who's the Scottish National Party MP here at Westminster. Natalie Bennett, leader of the Green Party. Natalie, I've got to ask you the question. There's much debate about it. There are, if there are debates, you are going to be leading those debates for your party? Absolutely. No doubt about that? No doubt. Thank you. Um, and then we've got here uh, Rupert de Morley in the middle there, who's Minister at DEFRA with responsibility for the natural environment and science, of course, for the Conservative Party. Um, Kate Palmer, who speaks on the environment for the Liberal Democrats in the House of Lords. And William Cash, who's a journalist who's written for a wide range of newspapers, magazines. He's the founder of Spears, a subscription magazine for um, high-end individuals. Do they got to be worth five million or more to subscribe to the mag? Um, no, that's not true. Um, not uh, it's um, uh, anybody can uh, actually. Anyway, so any, anyone here could. British Airways, if they are. Uh, okay, we got, we got. Okay, okay, <laughs> we got it. We got it. We got it. Um, and he is a conservation specialist by his profession, and he speaks for UKIP on heritage and tourism. So to encourage them along, give them a bit of a welcome. Well, so the, 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 the radio programme called Any Questions, which I have an involvement in, has a sort of formula, a format, and we're going to stick more or less to that, but there is our differences. For instance, we've got six panellists, and then each of them on this occasion are going to have 90 seconds, and I've got a watch to make sure that they stick to it, more or less, will actually stick to it, um, in, in order to outline where they're coming from, from their respective parties. Um, and then we go into your questions, which we've selected from a big, big number that you sent in, and we've sort of categorised them so that we get through uh, uh, quite a wide territory within the broad field. Um, we've got about an hour, and, uh, an hour and three quarters or so. Now, that sounds a lot, but by the time they've answered the questions succinctly, by the time you've come back... I notice you smile, um, Barry. Uh, you've come back in on those questions, and I hope you will. There are microphones, I think. Can the microphone holders hold up their mics so that we can... There, there, there they are. So when you want to come in, put up a hand. I will select you, and the microphone will race to you. If you feel like saying who you are, please do so. If you don't wish to, don't do so. The incentive, the whole event is being uh, televised. Um, not, not televised, it's going online uh, to go onto YouTube or, or, or wherever. Um, and therefore, there should be plenty of time for you to comment and cross-question, because this is very, very much um, your event. So, Natalie, you kick off. OK, well, I think I'm probably the right person to kick off, because I'm delighted to welcome you all to the uh, constituency of Hoban and St Pancras, which I'm standing in. You might think that um, perhaps natural environment isn't a big part of Hoban and St Pancras if you've just come along Euston Road, although maybe air pollution is, uh, and you'd be right on that. But I would also point you to a beautiful natural spot a very short distance from here, the Camley uh, Street Natural Park, which is right behind King's Cross uh, and uh, St Pancras stations, uh, an old coal pit, and it's very beautiful if you ever find yourself with an hour to kill for a train. I've just come back from the Green Party Liverpool uh, conference and what I said there in my conference speech I think sums up where the Green Party comes from on the environment. We understand that everything, our society, our economy is entirely dependent on the natural world. We need to stop thinking about nat nature as some kind of luxury extra, an add-on. It's essential to absolutely everything about our existence. So just for, we were asked to introduce the manifesto, and I've got about 60 seconds next. We want a Nature and Wellbeing Act. That's absolutely essential to say not just that we have to protect what we've got now, but we have to improve it, given the kind of damage we've inflicted on it already. We want to repeal the national policy planning framework, and particularly its presumption in favour of development and return power to local communities with a very strong guidance from the centre that says you have to protect the ecology. We want to use reform of the common agricultural policy to improve farming practices, particularly focusing on soil protection. My first degree is agricultural science, so I can get really geeky about soils, but I promise you I won't do that tonight. Um, reducing flood risk, improving water quality, 
and assisting in carbon capture. And a really critical point, we need to set up, as this government promised and hasn't done, a coherent network of marine reserves. We need to protect and restore our oceans. Of course, that's a very narrow focus. I could say much more about <coughs> creating a circular economy, focusing, first of all, on reducing resource use. But? But I'm going to run out of time. Uh, reducing waste, transport, walking, cycling, local transport, and climate change. We need to do vastly more. As the marches and uh, rally at the Green Party conference said, it is time to act on climate change. There's no doubt about that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> William Cash. Um, yes, I joined UKIP um, in the summer um, because uh, I felt that successive governments have betrayed the countryside. Um, UKIP is actually, and I'm here to argue that UKIP is not in any way the environmental nasty party, but it's actually the most pro-countryside party of them all. And um, we believe passionately that our, the natural resource of the countryside um, has been uh, violated by successive governments. So what we stand for uh, is being a, a party that actually puts the countryside first. We do not believe in HS2. We believe it will have great environmental damage. We believe that houses should be built in the right place. We are deeply worried about the cult of ugliness. Uh, we do not believe that uh, wind turbines uh, are uh, in any way necessarily the right form of energy mix for this country. We are concerned that uh, our waters uh, have uh, serious problems with regards to fisheries. We want to reclaim our sovereignty. Um, above all, we're the party that believes that we should be protecting our countryside, not desecrating it in the way that the current government have been. And we believe that uh, the only way uh, to do that is to actually uh, amend the NPPF, when I agree, uh, Natalie, with regards to it being in favor of development, we need to go back to a presumption in favor of conservation. But above all, we need to give people the right to enjoy living in the countryside. Things like wind turbines, and I know this is controversial in this um, uh, debate, and I'm very happy to, to take some questions, but the reality is, is we believe that the landscape is owned by everybody, that the sky is a community asset. Uh, we believe in local democracy, and we believe that localism has been proved to be a sham. I don't want to get into the debate about climate change and the science. What I do want to get into the debate about is why is it, for example, that when 100 people in a village vote against something, um, planning inspectors overrule it. This should be a measured debate about local democracy, sovereignty of our waters and our countryside, and a, uh, a belief that, in fact, it is the Tories, for example, with their pro-bill, their roads, and it is completely fitting that we are stand sitting here against opposite Euston Station. It was the Tories in the 1960s who desecrated the Euston Arch and dumped it in the River Thames. The Tories have always been anti-environment. The Greens, as much as I agree with some of those things, are really a anti-capitalist party, and the Lib Dems are the party in favour of desecrating the countryside. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Much. Okay. Um, Ellie Whiteford. Thank you, Jonathan. Can I start by thanking the organisers of tonight's event for the invitation to be here this evening. Back in 2009, the Scottish Parliament passed a landmark Climate Change Act that introduced legally binding targets to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 42% by 2020. At the time, it was a world-leading piece of legislation, and though it was introduced by an SNP government, it was passed unanimously with the support of all the political parties represented in Parliament, and with substantial input and support from a wide range of civil society stakeholders. Those were hugely ambitious targets, and they've been hard to meet in the context of a couple of exceptionally harsh winters and low coal prices affecting the electricity fuel mix. But nevertheless, Scotland succeeded in achieving a 29.9% reduction in emissions between 1990 and 2012, which is significantly better than any other part of the UK and behind only Denmark and Finland in the EU. 
But I think the important thing to say is that the existence of those targets has helped to focus attention across government on what can be done and what needs to be done to achieve sustainable prosperity. Sustainable for people and sustainable for our habitat and our ecosystem. Whether we're talking about energy policy, which for me is where some of the greatest potential for progress resides, or whether it's housing policy, agricultural policy and land stewardship, a lot's been achieved, but there's still a great deal more to do. I'm looking forward to tonight's debate, and I hope it will help get the message across that we won't get a second chance to make the brave decisions we need to make now to build a more sustainable future. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Rupert de Morley. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, our 2011 Natural Environment <coughs> White Paper was the first of its kind for over 20 years, and it highlighted the urgent need to protect, restore, and improve our natural environment. We've already achieved over three quarters of its commitments, 48 local nature partnerships and 12 nature improvement areas with more to come through the new countryside stewardship scheme, the National Capital Committee advising on sustainable use of natural capital, and woodland cover at its highest since the 14th century and being substantially increased. The Chief Executive of Natural England told me the other day he's confident we can achieve our strategy to halt the loss of biodiversity by 2020, having already created over 150,000 acres of priority habitat, moved over 95% of SSSIs into favourable or recovering status, earmarked over 3 billion for the natural environment through countryside stewardship, and planted 10 million trees. I'd also mention our national pollinator strategy, that our coastal bathing waters are getting dramatically cleaner, that average roadside concentrations of nitrogen dioxide have dropped nearly 15%, that we've met the first carbon budget for 2008 to 2012 and expect to meet the next two with emissions down by a quarter since 1990, that we've prompted reform of the European fisheries policy to end wasteful discards, and that we've greatly increased the network of marine protected areas. Of course, there is still a lot to do. That's why it's so important to push on with the commitments in the White Paper and Biodiversity 2020. Harnessing the enthusiasm of scientists, the public, NGOs and farmers uh, with whom we're working so hard is the way to realise our shared ambition uh, uh, for the environment and enable us to become the first generation to leave it in a better state than we inherited it. Thank you. Um, and Barry Gardner. If you want to have peace in the world, create justice. If you want to have justice, live sustainably. In my view, it's that simple. And this year, we have the most extraordinary coming together of the world's governments, not just in Paris in December, looking at the climate change COP, but also in September with the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, those are the two landmark conferences of this year that will decide effectively the future of our civilization on this planet for many years to come. But there's another conference that's perhaps just as, if not more important, and that is the conference that'll take place in Addis Ababa in July, which is the financing conference for sustainable development. And if we don't get that right, we won't get the SDGs right. And if we don't get that right, we won't get Paris right either. So I think what we have is an extraordinary opportunity this year. How does that impact on the way in which the government in the UK should then respond? Well, the previous government, the Labour government up until 2010, put in place, commissioned the Lawton Report. It commissioned the Pitt Review. These were key and essential planks in getting it right. 
And if you look at the State of Nature report, the State of Nature report is not quite as optimistic as Rupert was. Um, the State of Nature report says that of the 6,000 UK species, 600 of them uh, are at risk of extinction. Um, if you look at the amount of forestry that uh, Rupert was talking about till 2020, actually, uh, DEFRA's own statistics say that 225,000 hectares of that target to 2020 will not be met. So I'm not as sanguine as he is about what is happening in the UK. What I am clear about is that the key thing on the sustainable development goals is that they're universal. It's not the developed world doing it to the developing world anymore. It's us setting targets for ourselves in the developed world just as much. And so we have to look inwards. We have to look at what we're doing. And if we look at what we're doing, how are we going to meet target number three on, on health if we don't tackle air pollution, which the Natural Capital Committee says is costing us between nine and 20 billion pounds a year. <coughs> How are we going to do this unless we look at access, which if you look at Professor Bateman's uh, statistics in the Natural Capital second uh, study uh, last year and again in this year. Barry, I'll, I'll, I'll wind up. I'll wind up. You'll see that access to forestry, access to woodland, um, is actually critical, both in health terms, but where you locate it, either close to the infrastructure or simply for commercial forestry, makes the difference between a net loss in commercial forestry of about 60 million a year, or a net gain in benefit to society of about 650 million pounds a year. And, so, and, and you can return to some of this, I'm sure you'll have time, but I'm going to, as I did with the others, request Sorry. you to pause. Um, Kate Palmer. Thanks, Jonathan. Uh, well, I joined my party back in the 1980s when the Lib Dems in Horsham were um, the only people who were campaigning to save local um, space because it was important to local people and we needed to do so just to protect the natural resources. And I think I have a slightly different view of what the Liberal Democrats do locally to William's uh, view of, of us. Um, we, in our constitution, uh, have it that we want to protect the environment for future generations. That's written down, and I think one of the things I'm most proud of about us in this coalition with our Conservative partners is the things that I can say that we've achieved for the environment. Of course, we haven't achieved anything. You know, for everything. Sorry. We haven't achieved... That's a point. <laughs> we haven't achieved everything, um, but I think we have achieved a lot. Um, Rupert mentioned some of the things that the, um, the coalition has achieved. We've introduced the Green Investment Bank, which has put 3.5 billion capital into uh, renewable, renewables in the future. We've introduced the Natural Capital Committee, which is creating the building blocks to actually bind what we believe is important, natural capital, into our, uh, our framework for accounting. Um, and you know, we've also, through Ed Davey, who's been the uh, Secretary of State at, at DEC, taken a, uh, a leadership role in Europe on climate change, which, as Barry has rightly said, it's absolutely vital that we move forward on this issue as we approach the Paris conference in December later this year. We haven't achieved everything, but we've got a, uh, a platform that we can stand on, and we've made a clear commitment. We've made a commitment in, in two ways. Firstly, we have said that we will work with other parties if we are in a future coalition government on the crucial issue of climate change. And we have also put one of our, uh, we've set out what our, will be our five priorities by putting them on the front page of our manifesto. We have said that protecting the environment will be one of those priorities. And to briefly summarise, so I don't go over my 90 seconds, we have said we will introduce a Nature Act, recognising the importance of uh, protecting nature for its own sake and for the benefits it brings to people's health. Uh, and their enjoyment and their quality of life. We will bring in a Green Homes Bill, which will be about desperately ratcheting up the uh, energy efficiency of our homes. We will bring in a Green Transport Act, which will be to ensure that we have sustainable solutions to some of the major transport um, problems that are facing us. We will bring in a Zero Waste Act, which will look at tackling uh, the waste problems that we have and moving towards a circular economy, where I think we haven't achieved as much as we could have done. Um, uh, over the last uh, five years. Uh, and, and finally, a Zero Carbon um, Act, which will be about trying to ensure that we have the necessary targets to bring down our carbon 
uh, as, we, as we look to meeting some of the international and uh, uh, national targets that we have. So that's the platform, a record of action, a promise of more. Okay, we've had uh, alleged successes, alleged failures, and quite a lot of promissory notes. Time to go to our uh, first question, please, which comes from Cathal Hutchison. Cathal. Okay, so um, my question is, uh, what are the three things that each panel member personally thinks are key to ensuring uh, an eco ecologically sustainable future? What do you personally, personally think are the three things that are the key to sustaining, to ensuring an ecologically sustainable future? Um, Rupert de Morley. Um, I certainly think that tackling climate change is right at the top of the list. Uh, I think that we must halt the loss of species um, through actions uh, affecting habitat and particularly winter feeding. Um, we need to tackle water quality. That's it. <laughs> That's your three. Okay. If you're happy with those three. It'll do. You've got a few more you want to add. I've got plenty more. <laughs> yeah, I thought you might have plenty more where those came from. There's, there's, there's three. We've got those. It's, it's, it's interesting. Um, free from you, Natalie. Okay, well, first of all, um, I'm going to sneak two together and make them one, if I'm allowed, which is uh, energy policy, two things. We need to focus and get serious about energy conservation. And sadly, particularly when you listen to the two largest parties talking, it's the kind of Cinderella that gets tucked on the end. And it's absolutely critical because it's really important to getting democratic buy-in. The fact is, you know, we have a huge problem with fuel poverty in Britain. And that comes about because we have a terrible quality of housing stock. We need to tackle that. We need to put serious government money into that. And we also need to get serious about renewables to supply the energy that we need. So energy conservation and renewables, and those renewables we should be focusing on looking at breaking up the big six energy companies, breaking up the vertical integration, and really focusing on having community-owned energy which is very much an answer to Mr. Cash's uh, comments uh, about you know, local resistance to wind farms. Balkham is a wonderful example. They had the anti-fracking process, possibly somewhat to the surprise of Balkham itself, uh, and then they decided they were going to start a community energy company and generate their own energy as an alternative to the fracking. So item one, conservation, Renewable just energy. on that, if I, if I just clarification on that. Um, if you approve of that, do you also approve of what William Cash is saying? That if local people do not want, however beneficial it might be to the environment, um, a wind farm or uh, any such uh, development, do you approve of that? Is that what localism implies? Well, I, I think you've, you've got to look at the scale of it and what you're talking about. You're one so it does partially apply, but not generally. Well, well you, ha you, have to, you have to look at, the, you know, if you're talking about nationally important things, like, for example, you know, tidal energy, particularly tidal lagoons. I no, think no, I'm asking specifically about things which provokes much yeah, debate. Well, 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 yeah, and I think, I think the balance has to be struck that um, locally, you know, one wind farm, the aim should be to win the locals over. Alex, that should I, be the I aim. Can I just interrupt for one second, Natalie? You, you can actually go, although Natalie's got one more to come, but you can pick up on that one and give us your three, and then I'll come back to Natalie for another one. Well, I just want to pick up on Natalie's yes, do, point please. about the community wind farm. I think if you, uh, I've been campaigning uh, for the last three years, and a lot of these projects are touted as community wind farms, but in fact, they have absolutely zero community support. But what actually happens is that then, um, if they do get the planning permission, which is not usually because the council have approved it or because the parish have approved it, but because it is coming down from the EU uh, and from a top-down government planning inspector, what actually happens is it then, get it then gets flipped, and it's usually owned by a foreign energy company. This idea that these local community projects are in any way owned by the community is a complete fiction. They are, it is commercial trading and flipping properties in a way that um, makes a complete nonsense of localism. I'll okay, just... actually, I'm going to get you to hold on. I'll, I'm going to let Natalie finish off first, and then I'll come back to you. Okay, well, I, I was trying to count energy conservation and renewables no, as one. Okay, all right. go on, I'll give it to you, but just be brief on the other two. <laughs> uh, all right, well, um, second point is we have to utterly transform our agriculture, get away from industrial agriculture that's trashing our soils, that's trashing our biodiversity, 
and you know, particularly neonicotinoids and bees, but the whole our use of pesticides, our use of fossil fuels in agriculture, that has to change. And then my third one is very simply our use of fossil fuels. We know we have to leave at least two thirds of our known fossil fuel reserves in the ground if we're going to avoid catastrophic climate change. We have to get away from fossil fuels. And I'll come back to you, William, for your other two. Um, I think we should stop a sort of Disneyland approach to uh, the countryside, as is particularly espoused by a, a country file. Um, it's a great program, but it, it's not a realistic um, look at what really goes on in nature. I was enjoyed reading in the Sunday Times, I'm sure everyone else saw it, that the wild lynx might be being put back into Scotland. It's a very interesting example of how people need to understand that we, we, one of the reasons that the um, species is out of kilter in various ways, whether it's deer, is because um, predators aren't allowed or haven't been encouraged to actually roam. And I think this is a real major problem in terms of actually having a healthy ecological system. So that's the first one. Second one is fisheries. Uh, it is, uh, I read fish, fish, Fisherman in Devon, um, the, the quota they have for their 10 meter or less boats is such that they don't even have, uh, their quota is only enough fish for four fish uh, and they have to, they don't even have enough money to get the diesel. The reality is, is that we have to reform uh, the fisheries situation, which is killing our uh, ecological habitat, uh, marine habitat, but also, more importantly, um, the coastal communities of fishermen. Is that to get rid of quotas or to make them no, more I, well, beneficial? As I say, in, in UK, obviously, we believe the best way is to reclaim our sovereign waters and to actually leave the EU. I know that actually uh, Greenpeace and UKIP are very much in agreement on this. Of course, they believe that it should be just reform of the EU, but we're on the same page there. Um, and thirdly, I think the other important point I would make is that um, my view is that uh, there isn't enough uh, money being spent on the sort of technological research to get the right energy mix. I think we've got the balance wrong. Uh, we actually are not opposed to uh, wind in uh, the right location. But at the moment, so much of it is in the wrong location for the reasons that I've outlined. So it's about getting the right energy mix and not regarding, uh, not politicizing the environment and climate change so that it's something that politicians can strut in the EU or at um, uh, various conferences. Uh, the reality have you, is... Have you so, sorry, William. Sorry? Have you so far been avoiding politicising the issue altogether? Is that... Because if you... There may be those who think you've been quite political in what you've been saying so far. Well, I... You want to, what you mean is, am I, if I were to interpret it according to a sort of detached observer's perspective, don't politicise it as so long as they agree with you. No. No, what I'm... I'm actually uh, quoting um, Rupert Soames who is um, the CEO of Agrico, which is the global company which provides temporary power to countries and cities when they need energy quickly. And he has said that politicians have turned energy policy into an irresistible sandpit in which they'd like to play. They talk about energy and CO2 reduction allows them to project all sorts of political characteristics that they are clean, caring, modern, technology savvy, far-sighted, but little is done very little of any consequence, and we always miss our targets. And we are continuing to completely miss our targets because they are completely unrealistic. Thank you. Uh, Kate Parmenter, um, well, your three. Yeah, the three things in terms of delivering um, an ecologically sustainable future. I think the first thing is we've seen the success of targets, binding targets on climate change. We feel as the Liberal Democrats that there need to be binding targets for, for biodiversity, for water, uh, and for clean air. Because if you don't have targets then we don't get the, the drive into uh, industry and we don't get the funding streams to deliver the, um, uh, the, uh, the answers that we need on those, those key issues. Secondly, we believe that the initiative of setting up the Natural Capital Committee was the right thing to do under this government uh, and we've committed to put it on a statutory footing and to maintain it into the future because we need uh, the progress to be taken on identifying where government needs to move next in terms of uh, protecting the resources for the future and also being a, um, uh, a challenge to the government. And thirdly, following on a, a bit from what um, Natalie said, we would argue that uh, for a national food strategy, because we think you've got to bring together quite a lot of different disciplines if we're actually going to make a big difference for our ecology, we need to look at 
the CAP, we need to look at the public procurement and the money that we're spending on the, the food that we're, that we're buying, um, and, and use those various tools to bring together a coherent policy which delivers affordable and sustainable food for the future whilst protecting our ecology. Thank you. Um, Barry, Barry Gardner. Three things. There's a child in Africa. She's sitting on a patch of arid desert ground. She's about six years of age. And in her hand, she's clutching a cob of maize. She's thin. She's too thin. She's actually starving. And she wants to eat the cob of maize. But there's another hand on that cob. It's the hand of a man. He's not a man from her tribe or from her country because her country's a poor country and he's not a poor man. He's a rich man. And as he pulls the cob of maize out of her hand, he says just nine words. Sorry, kid. I need that to run my car. Food security, water security, energy security. Those are the absolute fundamental questions of our age, and those are the three things that we have to address. Thank you. Energy security. Sorry. I proposed with the Cross Party, with Tim Yeo in the House of Commons, the amendment uh, that was for a decarbonisation target by 2030. It was voted against by the coalition government. Food security, we need to stop encouraging farmers and land managers to do the wrong thing and encourage them to do the right thing. In terms of land management, Natalie spoke about soils, absolutely critical. We're wasting, we're, we're just washing away our soils. And water security absolutely fundamental, not just to the way in which we use our water in this country um, and manage it, both for drought and for flood, uh, but also in the world at large, it is the key strategic issue now for all the armies of the world. All the military strategists say that it is water conflict that is going to be the key flashpoint in the world. So energy security, food security, water security. What it means is we have to live sustainably. Thank you. Um, Ailey. Three things. The first one's been mentioned already, climate change targets. I think that has to operate at a global as well as at a national level. Uh, the second thing is enabling investment in renewable energy. And unfortunately, I think that's something that's uh, very difficult in the current political context. Uh, for example, uh, at the moment we're seeing the rug really being pulled out from under investment in offshore renewable technology, largely because through the new contract for difference they're having to compete with more tried and tested onshore renewable projects. And I think if we're going to meet uh, those climate change targets and make a transition to a more sustainable energy mix, then we really need to incentivise investment in renewables. Uh, and last but not least, number three, uh, investment in uh, home energy efficiency. It's something that certainly in this financial year, the Scottish Government's invested uh, £60 million in, and I've seen in my own constituency the benefits of people getting insulation in homes that are really not very energy efficient, uh, and that's both homes in the public sector that have been insulated and homes that are privately owned. Uh, and that's made a huge difference to our ability to meet our own climate change targets, but it's also uh, really improved uh, people's quality of life. And just before I uh, stop, I'd like to come back on something that was said a bit earlier about the countryside, as if uh, the countryside is some kind of national park. Now, we do have national parks, and it's very important that we protect them. But I represent a very rural constituency where we produce food, uh, where that land is uh, stewarded in a very responsible and sustainable way. But I think it's critically important that we understand that our countryside is a working environment. People are trying to earn a living off that land. Uh, and it's important that we don't see it as some sort of playground that we go at the weekend. It's actually a place where people live, where people have communities, and where they have to earn a living. 
Thank you. I, 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 I'm not going to open it up yet, but I want to go back just for your three. You put the question, Cathal. What are, what are, what are, what are your three? Um, I would say that um, we need a basic ecological ethic. So we need to be, you know, for me at least, um, the, the baseline needs to be, you know, to think about the, the effects, the spiral off effects of, you know, e you know, the actions that you take so that you're aware of how, you know... Um, One thing impacts upon another. Yeah, exactly. Um, I would also say that, um, obviously, consumption is a massive driver of, um, you know, what's going on in terms of loss of species and that kind of stuff. And I would say that, um, you know, in our society, in terms of an individual level, there's not, really a, there's not really any tangible pressure to particularly be sustainable. Most of it comes from your own um, conscience, perhaps. And I think in some ways, in terms of, say, use of energy, there could be, you know, an assessment on people's energy <coughs> needs and then, you know, an, a low basic rate for that. So then anything above what people's maybe assessed energy needs would be would be at a higher rate, something like that. Um, and that, then, that, that, that probably does it. Okay. I asked for three. I think you've just given me three. OK, yeah. <laughs> very eloquently. Thanks very much. Very Peter well. Lawrence, your question, please. Peter Lawrence. Is it right that governments continue to give to support to and encourage the fossil fuel industry to continue extraction? Um, let me come back to you on this, first of all, bearing in mind how important oil has been in the debate about the future of Scotland. Ailey Whiteford. I think it's an important question to ask, and maybe the first thing I would say is how many people in this room heat their homes through gas or oil heating? Yeah, most of us. And I think, in a way, I would frame my response to the question around that. It's a very balmy 10 degrees in London uh, this evening, but uh, I was at home uh, earlier this morning where it really wasn't uh, nearly so warm and uh, where there are weather warnings in place tonight. Uh, we had sleet yesterday. Our winter is very far from over. And I think in that context, clearly, you know, we have a finite, very precious resource in fossil fuels they will still, I think, essentially be part of our energy mix for some years to come. But that should not stop us from uh, starting to make a transition to uh, better alternatives. But until, until and just on, on the thing itself, it's obviously, it, despite the drop in uh, oil prices, etc., it remains a very important part of the Scottish economy. Absolutely. Go to Aberdeen and you would not be popular if you said we're going to cut off... Um, fossil fuel extraction, um, and, and the and SNP I... would suffer enormously. So, are you not, in a sense, having it both ways? You talk up the SNP, talks up the vital importance of renewable energy, as you've just done, and at the same time, talks up the vital importance of maximising the output and profit from the uh, fossil fuels in the North Sea. Well, I think that really illustrates why we need a more responsible management of that resource. And I would like to see control of that, of course, brought to Scotland, where we would be able to manage that in a more sustainable way uh, and use it in a more responsible way, but also extract it in a way that makes the most of what's already uh, a very depleted basin, but nevertheless a basin in which uh, working standards, health and safety standards, are much higher than in most other parts of the world. So, yeah, of course, my constituency is hugely dependent on oil and gas, but that doesn't mean uh, that people don't want to pick up the opportunities of renewable energy and see the transition, uh, uh, not just in terms of the local economy, but also in terms of the skill sets, because the same kind of engineering skills that are currently used in the oil and gas sector are exactly the kind of skills that are needed in an offshore renewable okay. sector that we're trying to develop. Thank you. Uh, Natalie Bennett, is it right that governments continue to give support to the fossil fuel industry? What you were saying earlier, your answer would appear to be no. Uh, absolutely. And I think particularly to focus on you know, our government, and one aspect of this is fracking. And this government has pursued what can only be described as a fracking fantasy. Uh, you remember at one point David Cameron said, um, oh, there's going to be frack fracked gas in Britain by the end of the year. And the industry said, uh, what? Um, but that fracking fantasy has is not just been the fact that you've heard George Osborne and David Cameron talk about fracking a great deal. You almost never hear them talking about renewable energy or energy conservation. But more than that, they're putting government money into it. They're offering tax breaks. 
they're offering research money, they're, they're putting money into promoting the idea of fracking. They're trying to find a way that they can bribe communities to and accept fracking. And you would stop, you would, you, would, you would absolutely say no fracking. Exactly. You know, and what would you say in the relation to oil being extracted in order to heat people's homes, as most people here, either in gas or, or oil, are heating their homes via it? What would well, you say I mean, that, that? that's where we need to have the transformation you know, very fast, both in terms of energy what efficiency. What does very fast mean? Well, I mean, what we need to do, do is actually is, you know, get out of, I mean, I entirely agree with the decarbonisation by 2030 target. That's a very sensible target. But we need to move as fast as we possibly can. And that means, you know, real action. And actually just talking about again here, I, I won't keep talking about, about this constituency all of the time. But there's been some very limited progress here on combined heat and power schemes that drastically cut the emissions. But we need to make much more progress on energy conservation as well. That's the really critical area. OK, let me, let me ask you, very on, that for purposes of argument, Labour comes to power with a working majority. Um, does it uh, continue to give support to and encourage fossil fuel industry to continue extraction, Peter Lawrence asks? Yeah. Um, let's go back to the fundamentals. Um, we have uh, a business-as-usual scenario which will uh, deliver about... 69 gigatons is what we know is the space up there. We have the INDCs, the Intended Nationally Determined Contributions, um, which at the best at the moment um, are going to uh, reduce that to about 57 uh, gigatons. We need to be at 42 gigatons. Don't take it from me, take it from Mark Carney, the governor, no, no, of, the there's, there's of, there's the there's governor of the Bank of England, yeah. has said that uh, there is a real problem with stranded assets because we know that half of the fossil fuel that has been already identified would have to stay in the ground if we are to meet those targets for emissions. And so at the moment, the market is banking on regulatory failure. We need to reverse that. We need to make sure that actually we do meet those targets and the way in which... Uh, the, targets Haley, themselves Haley, are, the targets themselves are fine. I'm sorry, we're, no, we're nowhere near meeting no, no, sorry, the emissions the targets, gap the, is the, enormous. The, the, the targets I'm asking about, the targets. You said we've got to stick to the targets. Are the targets fine in themselves if you, did, no. if you were to stick to them? If, we need to get to 42, and, and we're not there. In terms of so, so let, let's come back. So, what does the uh, your so, government yeah. would well, let, take the yeah, action to? You've got, yeah. Yeah, but you've got to be sharp and brief on it because a lot right. of people who want to speak. Okay, um, and in the audience, not least, we will upgrade the energy efficiency of over five million homes. Ailey talked about the way in which we depend on gas and oil. Upgrading the efficiency of homes is the best way of doing this because it means that instead of uh, worrying about getting the, the the oil to heat the homes, you reduce the necessity to heat them. So. We, that's a long-term uh, task, and we will designate energy efficiency as a national infrastructure priority. There will be free personal home energy reports for half a million homes a year, because two-thirds of households have never had one. There will be help for 200,000 homes a year to upgrade their homes, saving them an average of £270 a year on their bill. Um, up to a million interest-free loans for home improvements. If and you do look you at regulate... Sorry to, 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 to press you on this. It is the question. You're being asked whether the fossil fuel industry should be encouraged to continue extraction. Am I right to interpret you as saying that you've got these other things and that you believe there should be regulation to, to diminish the ability of the market to produce... The, quest, the question was, should we ke keep on providing subsidies to the industry? No, it says give support to and encourage. Yeah, Let's stick with encourage. the encouragers. Should you encourage the fuel, fossil fuel industry to continue extraction? Well, support rather implies money. I don't believe that the subsidy regime that is going into fossil fuels around the globe, over £530 billion a year, is right. And I think that actually the way of getting us to decarbonise um, and to make sure that we move to a decarbonised agenda and to stop the emissions and get them down to the 42 gigatons is to take away that global subsidy. And if you look at what's happened in Egypt, if you look at what's happened in Indonesia, if you look at what's happened in India in the past few months, the subsidies that they were paying to people to burn fossil fuels have taken advantage of the lower price of, of oil and they've then cut those subsidies in those countries. It was okay. exactly the right thing Kate to Palmer. do. 
Well, I think we should be incentivising um, companies to move towards more renewables. This government obviously created the first low carbon electricity market. We need to do more with the Green Investment Bank, though. We need to extend its remit and its capitalisation so that we can work with partners um, in, in, in Europe and elsewhere to get more money into um, renewables. As I said at the beginning, we believe strongly that you do need regulation, and we would propose that uh, we would want to see um, the amount of uh, renewables coming from uh, going into ele electricity supply to be doubled by 20, 2020. And like both Barry and um, uh, Natalie, we believe very strongly that we do need to do a lot more on um, making our homes more efficient, given how much heat comes out of our homes. And we are saying that there needs to be a, a, a target of 10 million homes by 2020. One of the reasons we've made, I think, less progress on um, uh, home insulation over the last five years, and certainly I would like to have seen, is that we haven't given people um, the incentives to take it up. And I think the, the, one of the gentlemen earlier was talking about, you know, we need to respect the fact that as consumers, people have choices. Um, we feel very strongly that if you provide um, uh, council tax rebates to people if they take up um, energy uh, efficiency measures uh, over a 10-year period, that is one way that the gov central government can help people to um, heat their own homes, deal with fuel poverty and tackle um, some of the... Uh, but you, you don't, you don't, again, you don't, you wouldn't seek to regulate more than it is presently regulated, the fossil fuel industry. I think it's very difficult, as, as Ellie was saying, that um, we have to recognise that in the short to medium term, fossil fuels are still going to have a, a role to play, and what government's role is to do is to try and incentivise the necessary step change into the alternatives. Thank you. Um, William, you talked about getting the right mix in the, in the energy balance. Are, they, are governments right to support the extraction of fossil fuel? Well, I mean, take, for example, uh, a BBC figure um, in December where the contribution of wind to the UK's energy consumption was 0.04%. Um, and on an average summer night, it's only running at 13% capacity. The reality is, as I said before, um, the re the, we are, of course, we have to be uh, extremely responsible regarding the environment. But we also have to think about the fact that the green levy is pushing a lot of people into fuel poverty. And we have to be realistic. The reality is, is that as much as 30% of our UK generating capacity will be closed down by 2020. And the reality also is, and this is a, a terrifying figure, that um, uh, although people like to talk a lot about China and renewables, China and India between them are building four new coal-fired power stations a week. So the reality is, and I also really want to make this point because I see it every day where I live in the countryside, you have a farmer who's putting up a, a wind turbine, a community wind turbine, I should say, Natalie, sorry. Um, and uh, what actually you also see is that same farmer driving around with two Range Rovers because of the subsidy, uh, belching diesel oil, diesel into the atmosphere. And of course, he's chugging around in a, in a, in a, in a tractor that was probably built in 1980s and is also um, uh, contaminating and polluting the environment. The reality is this is just not real. And um, for all the rhetoric, the practicalities just don't work. As German magazine Der Spiegel has stated, Germany's CO2 emissions haven't been reduced by a single gram despite all their wind turbines. In fact, Germany has had to build more coal and gas-fired plants. Because it went away from nuclear. The reality is... Um, <laughs> just, on, just on that point, that, in case it wasn't better, that was because they gave up nuclear following the Japanese... Um, <laughs> Uh, disaster. Yes, yes, but the reality is, is that um, uh, it, in this country we can't afford uh, to. Uh, I mean, w w I think there's a strong argument that we should have some nuclear capability. But the reality is that's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making. <laughs> <is> <laughs> there is the, the point, point I'm making. The point I'm you. making <laughs> is that the point I'm making is that wind isn't sufficient. Renewables aren't sufficient. We have to have backup. And the reality is, as I pointed out just now before your interruption. The truth is, you're living in a fantasy world if you honestly think these targets, which are, as I say, brought together in the sandpit of the EU and other things, are going to solve our immediate problems and people in the rural communities not being able to pay their bills because of your absurd subsidies. So please, Barry, be a little bit more polite and pipe down. Hang on, right. hang on, hang on, now, hang on. Can William, I just William, say one William, final you pipe. Thing. Okay. No, no, one William, final... William, you pipe down too. Now, <laughs> you've had your go, you can come back in, and if he wants to pipe up, he can in a bit. But meanwhile, it's over to you, um, Rupert Moy. Thank you, Jonathan.
<clears throat> um, <laughs> Ellie was uh, saying that um, fossil fuels will play a vital role for a considerable time, and she's right. Uh, as we move towards a renewable future, and we're at 15% renewable uh, energy now and 35% low carbon, uh, we need to appreciate that some fossil fuels are less damaging than others. So um, gas, better than oil and coal, for example. Fracking? Um, uh, well, uh, actually, the, the, the gas that, that comes from fracking is, is less uh, damaging than LNG, for example, uh, and... Um, needs to be, we need to uh, work on that. Um, carbon Sorry, capture what do you mean and, you need to work on Well, we need to, we need to do it, Jonathan. Yeah. Um, I was going to mention carbon capture and storage, which is an important uh, component uh, of policy, and we are investing a billion pounds in rolling that out at scale. Um, this is one of the most attractive countries in the world to invest in for <coughs> renewables. Uh, Kate mentioned the, the Green Investment Bank. Um, in January, we auctioned 27 projects to power 1.4 million homes uh, with renewable energy. So um, we are uh, moving in the right direction. Too slowly? Uh, we would all want to go faster, but um, there are um, pressures in every direction. Uh, and I think, um, yes, we must do better. OK. I'm gonna, yeah, sorry, Barry, you want, you want to pipe up? Well, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just wanted to, to point out from what Kate had said. Um, because she rightly said that the progress has been too slow on energy efficiency. Um, but, of course, uh, I mean, Kate is here representing the Liberal Democrats as their spokesperson in the Lords. But in that department, we had a Secretary of State who was a Liberal Democrat, and the Minister in DEFRA, who is a Liberal Democrat, is not here to, to defend those policies. Now, the Green Deal um, was supposed to be the way of dealing with this. And the Green Deal, I think, ought to be acknowledged, was a terrible failure. And, yeah, and, yeah, what's and, coming? Of course, uh, just, just, just to pick up, yeah, pick up on that, and then you carry on. Sure. I think, as I said, I was, I was entirely honest with the audience. I don't think that we've done as much on energy efficiency as we would have wanted. It's not been a total failure. We've had two million, sorry, one million homes have been um, uh, made energy efficient in the last two years by Green Deal and Eco together. That is not a failure. That is, that is people's homes that have been improved. Barry, OK, hold, hold on, that. hold on, Barry. I, I, I'm sorry. Uh, those figures are not uh, correct. If you look at the number of people, if you recall that actually Greg Barker, who was then uh, in charge of the, uh, the Green Deal policy, said that he would be having sleepless nights if by Christmas there weren't, uh, I think it was 10,000 uh, homes that had been done by the Green Deal. Uh, in fact, there were 34 or 36, I think, done by Christmas. Uh, and now what, what is being touted by the government and by ministers has actually been the number of homes that have had an assessment, not the number of homes that have had the work done having had the assessment. Very, very and briefly on that, Kate. Well, I'm not going to um, answer for Greg Barker, who is a Conservative minister, but I, w I would say... No, but it's your policy. No, what I, w I said quite clearly, we didn't manage to achieve as much as we had wanted. And I've said that in the future, one of the ways that we would address that is by encouraging people to have energy efficiency by offering them a council tax discount. Because that's one of the reasons why it has not worked as well as we had hoped. Chance for anyone in the audience now to, on this territory to pipe up. Um, down there. Uh, hi, Rosalie from the International Fund for Animal Welfare. Um, I... Uh, was uh, one of the managers of the energy bill uh, taking the Green Deal through the House um, with some of the lovely people on the panel. I just wanted to point out that although the Green Deal may not have achieved so much um, as you had hoped, um, one of the key reasons why the Green Deal was established in the first place was to tackle the problem of the private rented sector. Um, and uh, by 2016, it'll be illegal to rent out an FOG rated property because of the Green Deal and because of that legislation. The idea of it is it's aimed to uh, provide private rented sector landlords with the opportunity to do that for free. So we never expected that it was going to be, I mean, I say we, perhaps me and some of the other people working on it. What we expected uh, was that that was going to be the key thing that was going to deliver was the obligation on landlords, which doesn't hit in until 2016. So, so are you sorry? It, so is, yeah. is your is your is your view, having listened to, 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 to the panel on this, that the Green Deal is is a, is in itself uh, uh, essential, valuable, uh, and there's more to be done, but the jury's still out on how effective it's going to be? Is that right? 
Absolutely. If you live in a uh, FOG rated property for an EPC, your landlord will absolutely have to use the Green Deal to make your house warmer. Um, unless it's exempt because it's listed. So that's really, really important. Isn't part of the problem, the isn't, isn't part the problem with this? this people, people like talking about uh, big issues, in inverted commas, climate change. What do we do about the global commons? And, so on. And, and people tend to very easily switch off when it comes to green deals, when it comes to efficiency, when it comes to uh, saving energy in your house. We say, oh, it's a very good idea, but actually that isn't a big idea. Green it, crap, in inverted commas. Yeah, no, I think you know I where heard that, that, that quote comes from. I'm sure you wouldn't use that word, um, Rupert, but uh, <laughs> it is said that, uh, it is said, it reported that a very senior member of your party, um, perhaps arguably the most senior member of your party, actually used that that term to, to uh, respond to the sort of point that was being made. Utter nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> OK, any, any more points on this? Come in, yes, down here at the front, second row. Thanks. Uh, Rose from Friends of the Earth. Um, my question is on fracking. Last month, the government failed to implement tougher regulations on fracking, including banning fracking near drinking water. Do the panellists agree that until um, these protections are implemented in law and until the Independent Committee on Climate Change has completed their assessment of the climate impacts, there should be a moratorium on fracking, as there is in Wales and Scotland? Which, which protection do you have in, in mind? Just, just, just for those who are not across the proposal. So there, are new, there are 13 conditions that were proposed by the Labour Party, and that included banning fracking near drinking water. Right. So it's, the, so it's to ensure the protection of human health and the environment. Those, 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 those range of things. Okay, but also I'm not going to. Areas. I'm not going to come to you because it's you're saying what she thinks you ought to be doing. Um, um, so I'm going to go to William on this. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> well, the position on fracking is that um, we obviously believe that the best way to um, get uh, energy invested in um, industry is to not have the excessively high level which, uh, of energy, which, of course, um, we've had um, because of the uh, artificial market. So what I want to say is this. Um, I personally, and uh, we at um, uh, UKIP, believe that uh, shale does represent an opportunity, but it needs to be done in a very measured way. Um, we, I want to talk a little bit about um, what Edith said in regards to uh, the resources of Scotland. I was up covering the referendum. And what struck me is that we heard an awful lot about oil and gas and the natural resources of Scotland. But what we didn't hear anything about was that actually Scotland's greatest natural resource, to my mind at least, is its countryside, its landscape, its mountains, and its natural environment, which it, by simply putting wind turbines all over the uh, parts of Scotland is destroying the environment. The one good thing about fracking is that you can have screening, and it is much less harmful on the environment from that point of view. Now, okay. I'm sure you won't agree with that, but the reality is we want, and I think the Tories, I don't know whether they, they stole this idea, I don't know who had the idea first, but with sh shale, we want to... Uh, create a, a sovereign fund, and I would like to see the, uh, some of the uh, revenue that comes from shale being put into things like putting pylons underground. Let us at least make the countryside beautiful. Let us not subscribe to the cult of ugliness, and let us try and let people enjoy the great countryside, both of Scotland and England, and not destroy it. William, thank you. Thank you. And just so we, I just want to go very quickly, because we've got a lot of questions to get, to get through. Very, qu very, very quickly, come, okay, yes, of course you can. But um, try and answer the question that's been, that was raised from over there. Should there be a, mor a moratorium on fracking until these 13 conditions have been satisfied? The short um, answer is yes. And I was very proud to vote for that in the House of Commons. And since then, the Scottish Government has also, as has already been mentioned, um, declared a moratorium. I think it's been quite bizarre to listen to some of Bill's comments on this because if you think people were getting upset about a few wind turbines, my goodness, you ain't seen <laughs> nothing yet when you think about the environmental degradation that will come with onshore uh, shale gas extraction. Now, my concern about that is fundamentally about uh, the protection of our water table. I think there have been sufficient concerns raised that we have to be absolutely sure that we're not going to be uh, doing untold damage to our environment by uh, exploration for, for shale gas. But, you know, the other more fundamental question in the context of the... No, 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 hold it there. Hold, hold, hold it there. Hold, 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 no, sorry. sorry. No, hey, hey, hey. Hey. That's not like you. <laughs> I think I 
you, you've been very considered, very reasonable, and you're going to continue to be like that, I know. <laughs> so I can ask Natalie Bennett, just on the, on the moratorium question, do you favour a moratorium? You favour none of it at all, so imagine a moratorium uh, isn't enough. Uh, no, don't favour a moratorium because we want a ban. OK. Um, and, and I do just want to pick up with uh, Mr Cash's points. Um, I don't think most people in this room are going to recognise his description of fracking. And I also think you know, the planners in Surrey, uh, in Sussex, sorry, the planners in Sussex who said you can't drill that well here because of the noise from the lorry movements, the planners in Lancashire who said the noise of this is too much and they've had to have sent quadrillas gone back to the drawing board. I don't think this idyllic fracking that we're being described doesn't seem to correspond to reality. Should there be a moratorium on... If, if Labour comes to power, will there be a moratorium on fracking? Yep. Um, we uh, tabled the amendments that, that were spoken of. Uh, they would have guaranteed that no fracking takes place under groundwater protection zones, that there is no fracking not just within but also uh, under protected areas such as national parks, that environmental impact assessments had to be mandatory at all sites, that residents are notified on an individual basis of shale gas operations, and that all fugitive emissions, not just methane, uh, are, are recorded. So now, until all that's done, there would be a moratorium? Would, yes, and it, critically, the way the government dealt with this, and I'd be very keen to have... You're going to hear, so just give us uh, your view. ...feedback on this. The way the government dealt with this is that uh, they were defeated in the Lords, they brought it back to the Commons, and they talked it out so it wasn't allowed to be voted on in the Commons. Um, so the, that, the, the weakened amendments, the government played fast and loose. They said they were accepting the amendments, but they then weakened those amendments when they introduced them themselves, and they didn't allow it to be voted on the House of Commons. I think that was completely disingenuous. Uh, it was the wrong thing to do, and, and we would stand by the principles that we set out in those amendments. Rupert, the morning. Uh, there was a, a recent report by the Royal Society and others um, uh, having conducted an independent review of the engineering and scientific evidence, and it concluded that the risks can be managed in the UK if operational best practices are implemented and enforced through regulation. And the government and the Environment Agency uh, take the view that the regulatory environment is robust uh, and um, certainly um, up to protecting our environment. Um, the health so and safety executive... Sorry, sorry just to, don't, don't give the list, just because we want to come cut to, to the chase of your policy. So you, would, you are opposed to the moratorium. You're, you're charged yes. with, as it were, talking it out, um, filibustering it out. Are you opposed to the moratorium? Yes. Yeah. We, we believe, no need for it. We believe there is no need for it. Um, the health and safety executive scrutinises well design and monitors risk management for the whole life of the well. Uh, and... Um, uh, there are measures in place to protect groundwater. OK, just on that, if the Health and Safety Executive is saying OK and you are, and you are saying we'll have a moratorium, isn't that delaying from, from the perspective of producing uh, energy which is slightly less, by everyone's version, slightly less damaging in terms of the carbon emissions than fossil, other fossil fuels? Aren't you just um, kind of putting spanners in a, in, a, in a works you shouldn't do? No, not at all. Do you reject the Health and Safety Executive? Not at all. Uh, but the, climate change, the Committee on Climate Change has been absolutely clear about about the, uh, the emissions that need to be, the vagrant emissions that need to be uh, recorded. They've been clear that the safeguards that we proposed were the right ones. Um, now, what you'll notice is that the Health and Safety Commission has, according to Rupert, said that these things can be managed properly. I've no doubt they can be managed properly. We wanted to ensure that they were managed properly, and that's why we wanted it in legislation. The government refused to do that, and they paid for, played fast and loose. Kate, were you playing fast and loose in this coalition? No, yes. I mean... Um... Yes. Yes, he says. No, we weren't, actually, because we've, um, we have always recognised that what we need to do is move to a low-carbon future. And in the short to medium term, um, fracked gas is a less damaging alternative yeah. than coal, unabated coal. And, you know, as North Sea gas is reducing, until we can get to a more energy-efficient future, we are still going to have energy needs which requires alternatives. So we haven't said we would rule out fracking. What as Liberal Democrats we have said is three things. One, that there should be places where fracking should not happen, and that is why um, in, in Barry's list, I mean, the government supported the, uh, the um, 
taking out national parks and AOMBs as areas where fracking could happen. Secondly, as Liberal Democrats, we have said that ensuring that the environmental protections are in place is key. And as you know, not only the health and safety, there are various other regulators who will have to be involved. And thirdly, that local people are involved, that this won't become like nuclear and it's a national infrastructure project. Local people have a say. Those three things, lo localism, um, uh, environmental regulation and protection are critical. What I would say, which hasn't been mentioned by the panel, is one of the reasons also why Liberal Democrats have not argued for a... Uh, a moratorium on, on fracking is because we're very much in favour of the progress for geothermal. And a lot of the regulation for fracking is absolutely the, the regulation that we need if we're going to uh, move towards um, that form of uh, heating in the future. So we support geothermal. We think there is greater protections needing. But until we have got to a future where we have no fossil fuels, we need to look at the least uh, damaging fossil fuels for the future. One more thing on this for anyone? Yeah, we've got several more. Okay, there and then there. Just if you make, you don't have to put it in the form of a question, you can make a statement so we can hear what you think. Barbara Young, we tried to get improved protection against fracking in SSSIs and European protected areas, and neither the Lib Dems or the Conservatives would support that. Absolutely right. Words, You're speaking from the perspective of being a Labour peer, Absolutely. as well as lots of other things before so that. So it was unfortunate that we couldn't get any Lib Dem support for that, so I really do have to question where the environment... Do you think it would be difficult for being in coalition with them after the election? Who knows what's <laughs> going to happen after the election? Politicians answer down here, guide right in the, in the middle. 